Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven, a show about writing and publishing with your host, J.F. Garrard. Welcome to another episode of The Artsy Raven. And today we have Cormac Baldwin. And Cormac is a speculative fiction writer, editor, and disaster human. When frightened, he frequently recounts long tales about his hometown's disappearing and reappearing graveyards or his most recent brush with fate before fleeing into the night. So welcome, Cormac. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> so we sort of encountered each other through uh, the Love Bites anthology, which we're both gonna be published in. Uh, well, I mean, right now it's December, it hasn't come out yet, but. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you started writing? Um, I mean, as, as stated, I am I'm a disaster human. That is that is my uh, forefront thing. And I am mostly a short story writer. Every so often I can be found like doing novellas. I don't have anything published that uh, route. But um, I as for why I started writing, my mother is an author, my sister is an author, and my father is technically an author. He's a scientific author, so I wasn't aware I had a choice. No one told me. Um, uh, and then uh, I mostly write horror now, and that was really just because I've always kind of written for a while short stories, and then I was like, no, that's not professional, because I was like 12 and had no idea what was actually professional, and I was like, I'm going to write novels from now on, and then at some point I went back to writing short stories, so I, I've kind of come full circle. I'm back to exactly where I started. So what kind of things does your family write, your sister and your mom? Uh, my sister is the easiest to explain. She's like hard sci-fi. There's a lot of robots involved. Um, my father is a scientific author. He works in oceanography. So like I see his papers and I go, okay, that's nice. It's okay. Cause he sees my papers and he goes, okay, that's nice. So it's a back and forth. And then my mother will write just about everything. She has three historical cozy mysteries uh, out a, let's see. I don't even know what it would be classified as. She doesn't classify it as horror, but it's about demons and fighting demons. So I feel like it should count. Um, and then she has three sci-fi romances out. So, and they're all novels. Um, I think she also does short stories, but I how wasn't they, allowed to read her stuff until I was 16. <laughs> have you ever asked them how they get published or? Uh, yeah, a lot, especially, well, okay. I didn't really have to ask for my mom because I just hear complaints. And she, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I got rejected again. I'm like, okay, mom, I'm 12. I don't know what that means. Um, I mean, scientific authorship, I kind of had to figure out on my own. Uh, my sister mostly submits to like contests um, and she would tell me a bit about the process, but I think my mother mostly did the traditional route, which is you go to a publisher, you say, here's an excerpt of my thing. Do you want to read the rest of the thing? And then you wait six months for them to tell you. Um, and so basically my understanding coming into this is writing is about waiting for things. <laughs> Yes, it is a lot of waiting, but it sounds like you guys can just start your own publishing company, given there are so many writers in your family. Yeah, no, no one told me that there, there were non-writers out there. No, no one said that. But okay, cool. So you said you're starting to write more horror, but you also say in your body you're speculative fiction. So you, I guess you write a bit of everything? Yeah, I mean, okay. It's really weird because I didn't realize I was a horror writer until I can actually trace it back April of last year. Um, I, I've always kind of written just the weird and the bizarre and sometimes the unsettling, but I didn't realize it was horror until I started listening to a horror podcast. And then I was like, that's not horror. That's what I write. And then I had to sit there and go, probably everyone else is right and I'm wrong so I mostly use it as an umbrella term for like I write a lot of weird things and it's horror is I guess the most open family of uh genres as it were because as long as something's a little bit strange people are willing to count it yes that's true there is a lot more open-minded um as a genre now I guess you must face a lot of rejection if you keep 
submitting stories. So how do you handle this? Like, do you get very upset? Do you ask your family to re to edit your stuff? No, do they edit your stuff? No, no, <laughs> no I actually haven't asked my family in, in a while. And now I ask my roommates, uh, but no, as for rejection, yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot, but at the same time, I don't know. First of all, this is not like my day job. This is not my career. So I, I have some of that emotional padding where I'm like, this does not vastly affect my emotional state. This does not say much about my future. And then the other thing is like, especially when I was very first starting to submit to things, I had no idea like how prestigious certain things were. So I had no problem just like, yeah, I'm just going to submit to Nightmare Magazine. There's definitely going to be no problems there as someone who has never been published before. Um, and then what you have to realize is that like, even for a tiny publication, uh, like the one that I'm working on right now, Archive of the Odd, that I'm sure we'll talk about later, um, it's tiny and there's already over 200 submissions. And basically the way I see it is if I submit one piece to somewhere that has say 500 submissions for a single call. I mean, if I want to get accepted, that's in the assumption that I'm like the top 2% of writers. And then like, even if I am part of that top 2%, the thing is maybe there was another story that was really similar to mine. And they're like, we can't have two of these. Cause that's what I'm facing right now. Editing is like, I love both of these stories but I can't put them in the same unthemed issue because it's going to look weird. They're too similar. So it's, I think it's just neutral, really. It's like, okay, I don't mind not being in the absolute upper echelons. And even if I am, I don't mind being in competition with other people. It's fine. Yeah, a lot of it seems to be, I don't know, almost like luck and opportunity, right place, right time kind of thing. And if the editor's yeah. in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> How much copy did the editor have before they read your story? Yeah. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, so you've published a few short stories and you also have this project on your website called Archive of the Odd. So what is that and how did that come about? Uh, so Archive of the Odd is, I say zine, but it's, uh, it's always weird because when it comes to zines, you essentially have like, I don't know what they would be classified professional. I don't, they're very fancy, glossy pages. Everything is very put together. And then you have like um, zines that are put together on like salvaged uh, stationery. We're closer to the former one. So I guess we're technically a small magazine, um, which is just one of those random things that you don't realize you need to think about until you need to think about. And basically it is the equivalent of found footage horror in a uh, literary setting. So it's stories told in anything but traditional prose. Um, no third person. I mean, first person can happen if it's like, say, uh, a police report kind of thing. But so there are a lot of epistolary, a lot of things in letters and diaries, but then also everything from receipts um, that I've gotten too that are in receipts. And I didn't realize that there were multiple ways of telling stories and receipts. I'm like, that's very limited information. Um, let's see, there's sales records, anything that you would expect to find in an archive, but not necessarily in a library. And it's meant as kind of a weird blurring the lines between what is real and the just really strange things that you can find in real life and the outright um, fictional. Like, is there a way you categorize it or is there a narrative or anything? Like, it almost sounds uh -huh. like running around and watching mini movies or something, you know? Uh, it's, it's an anthology, so it's not, it's not super well, um, like, defined. It's kind of, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of how to explain it. Um, now you have a submission page, so it sounds like people yes. can send in stuff. Yeah, yeah, you you can submit, and it comes out um, twice a year. The first one is unthemed because it's like, okay, I, I just really wanted to gauge like how many of these stories even are there because I tend to write in weird formats, at, but I don't necessarily know how often it is that other people do, especially if you read from like traditional um, publishers, most of the time you're going to find like one unusual format thing per every mm. like six issues, which is 
Um, I feel like that also falls into the with editors where if you submit something in a strange format to them and they have one other story in a strange format, they're like, we're not putting this in both of these in. So it's a lot harder to get placed. Um, and so this is kind of like where we come together for everything that's just a little bit uncanny when it comes to what other places aren't quite willing to publish or are a little uncertain about. So when you say you write in a different format, like, what do you mean? Like, is it like, you mean the story doesn't have a beginning, middle and end? Or do you mean like your snatches of like yeah, a scene? Uh, or... uh, so that's, uh, it's, it's kind of like the archive principle. So let's see, I think out uh, the one that happens if you search my name um, is the final sale of the remaining works of E. Cutler which I regret naming every day because every time I have to say it, it's super long um, and I have to memorize it. Um, and so that's in the form of an auctioneer's website and they're listing a bunch of uh, tapestries and all by this one enigmatic E. Cutler. And it's his descent into madness and also summoning a creature from the depths of, I guess, artistic um, fervor. But it's all told very detached. It's from the perspective of someone who's like, here's this nice rug that he made. It's interesting how it just keeps on fractaling further and further. Hmm. And the auctioneer is also just super sardonic and does not like you colors. <laughs> so there's, you kind of get this, the auctioneer isn't quite a character, but we're seeing everything both through their eyes and through the lens of all of these random art pieces. Oh, okay. That's a very different way of telling a story. It's almost like a art exhibit almost. Like it's not, like you say, it's not a traditional uh, format of a story. Now, before we uh, started recording, we we're talking a little bit about day jobs and how like you don't have to quit your day job to be a writer. Because I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's my dream to be a full-time writer, but, but it's tough. Like I've met people that quit their jobs to be a full-time writer. And then after a couple of years, they're like, yeah, we kind of like eating. So um, <laughs> Eating is nice. We're a big Yeah, eating is nice, you know? So it's just, I think one of the things is, you know, there's a low barrier to entry for writing in a way, right? So everyone can write, but like, you know, how are you going to make a living? It's, it's just tough. So what kind of things do you do for your day job? Like you actually like your day job, you were telling me. Yeah, um, so actually, I'm a student uh, at university, so I have, oh, okay. if you start counting things up, I have like three jobs and then I'm also a student, but I guess uh, I, I like my day feels like, um, so I'm a bioengineering and toxicology uh, student, which occasionally you'll see weird things in my writing where like I can't allow ever so slight artistic license on chemistry. That's not a thing that can happen. I won't allow it. Um, but so that's the majority of my day. I'm at university. I'm actually where I am right now. This is someone else's whiteboard. I'm just in a study room. <laughs> oh, you're in the study, room, <laughs> the study rooms, yeah. Um, and then other than that, I work as a research assistant at a toxicology lab. Uh, previously, I've worked in bioengineering labs and then also toxicology service labs. And basically my job is I'm the technician, I make solutions, I help with research, but I'm not like the head honcho. I'm very much the person who runs around and says, okay, let's do this, let's try this. Let's see what happens if we do this. And then I also work nights at an assisted living facility. Uh, I'm an editor slash writer that one's a freelance I just do it whenever I have time and then I work with the disability services at my university I essentially am the live closed captioning uh, for a lot of visualizing slides and things like that and uh, helping with making formats more accessible it doesn't sound like you have enough hours in a day to do all those things but when you say it's so. living it's like nursing home Oh. Yeah. Um, well, it's technically like the spot between retirement home and nursing home, which is basically oh, okay. we help people with things like we help them with medication, we cut up foods, things like that, but they are, don't require full time care. Um, it's it's an in between state. It 
which makes us really hard to regulate and it's always fun especially with the pandemic just things change all the time <laughs> it's like okay what's happening yeah who knows yeah my grandma's at a nursing home but yeah across from her is like what they call senior residence right like where the yeah. seniors can live there and then they can go downstairs to the cafeteria so i guess you know they get some services but not all i guess it's something similar um which is in canada okay now going back to writing how long does it take you to do a short story uh, that really depends. I write a lot of flash. Um, well, I mean, I consider anything like under 2000 flash, which I know isn't the like official definition. Um, and that, that really depends because there's some where I've written them in like a two hour span and I'm like, this is actually decent. What happened here? Like, <laughs> what happened? And then at the same time, I've gotten stories that capped out at 2000 words that took me repeated going back adding like a few words at a time going back and then you know rereading editing writing something new and that can take like multiple weeks to get mm -hmm. something done there are documents in my uh orphan ideas tab which is basically just everything that is like okay you don't have a place yet maybe i'll go somewhere um They've been there for six months or so. And I'm like, maybe this will get finished, who knows? So do you have any advice for people that want to write short stories? And, you know, sometimes they don't know what to do. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, of course, the easiest is to tell them to just start. But sometimes yeah. they overthink. I think that's part of the issue, right? They start thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Right. So, um. I, I feel like I might either be the best or the worst person to answer that. Because, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, the part of the good thing about having a limited time is that I can't stop and go like, okay, is this a good idea? I'm just like, I have time. Go, go, see what happens. Um, and I think part of that is you just have to understand that some of the best stories are the really, really weird ones. And the ones that you don't necessarily like, you don't sit down and go, wow, this is so meaningful and beautiful off the top of your head when you first think about it. Uh, one of my favorite short stories is called The Sneakaboo. And it is about a, a toy walrus that comes to life and starts attacking, attacking people. So, I mean, like, I can't imagine like sitting down and just being like, okay, if a toy walrus started attacking people, is that a good story idea? Like you just have to go <laughs> at that point. Um, and then I also, I have the added benefit, which is true to my Generation Z um, sensibilities, which is I will write fan fiction every so often. Mm -hmm. And the people there are super nice and they don't care what you're writing. Uh, I've written an 8,000 word choose your own adventure about acquiring a toy lion. And people are like, this is great. I love this. Like, it's like, okay, that's, you, you get to, you get to realize that, oh, what readers want to read isn't necessarily, like, what makes the most sense off the top of your head, like, oh, this will, this will be so great, it's so perfectly structured and plotted, no, sometimes people want an 8,000 word, word choose your own adventure about acquiring a lion. Cool. Now, what is the latest project you're working on? I guess it's still, you're continuing your archive of the odd, that's, and um, I guess working on more stories to shop around. Uh -huh. So I am permanently in the middle of like eight projects. That's again, I just have this massive tab. That's just all the things that might go somewhere. Um, so yeah, as an editor, I'm on Archive of the Odd. We're currently finishing up our first round of submissions. And so uh, getting everything ready, uh, figuring out things like contracts, um, and then from a writerly standpoint, there's a couple of things that are a little bit further out at the moment. Finals week is coming up for me because, as I said, I'm a university student. So it's like actual writing is basically like, OK, if you have two hours, you can try. But let's face it, you're probably too nervous to write right now. So um, there's a few things that are still in the uh, add a few words as much as I can. Uh, standpoint and then I'm also working on a novel with uh, one of my friends we're collaborating on it 
Um, so I guess the good part is I don't have to write novella length things. The bad part is that means that I can't put in as much random things uh, without <laughs> making the entire project go off the rails because it's like, why did you put that in there? I don't know. I thought it was cool. Now we have to change the plot. Working with people is difficult. <laughs> it's no, so that's much true. Fun. It's so difficult. Like one, one of my best friends keeps telling me, we're going to write a book and we're, we're going to become millionaires. I'm like, oh my God, we've been, no, that's not going to happen. It's a ton of fun. It's so much fun. And luckily we're, we're like best friends and we can communicate really well. Okay, that's But good. at the same time, it's like, I'll send something and they'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I thought I didn't figure this was going to be fine. Um, yeah, so working, it's it's not half the work. It's actually secretly twice the work, but it's also twice the fun. So it's yeah. okay. Yeah, there you um, go. And then I also have a novella that is deeply within the uh, plunk three words in at a time. Uh, I really want to work on it more. And chances are, as winter break comes up, I'm going to do more on it. But at the moment, it's just like, this will happen as it happens. True enough. Now, you're going to do a reading for us. So could you tell us a little bit about the context of what you're reading before you start? Uh, yeah, so this is a short story that I have in Love Bites, um, which is the anthology of Love Gone Wrong. Uh, it is called Exaltation and Triptych because I'm secretly very pretentious. And basically, it is the story of someone who got buried alive and they just took that exactly the wrong way. Um, this was one of the, it was written in two hours and I looked at it and said, wait, this is okay. What happened here? <laughs> um, okay, we're looking forward to hearing it. Okay. I spat your name when the soil filled my lungs, my love. I clawed away the clay like the fingernail marks down your back. It took longer than I would have liked, and for that I commend you. You dug me deeper than your bloodied hands should have allowed, but even so, it was never more than a shallow grave. I made a promise. Wait, sorry, I'm going to stop you. I'm yes. going to ask you to start again, but read a bit slower. Okay, sorry. Okay. All right, yes. okay. Okay. I spat your name when the soil filled my lungs, my love. I clawed away the clay like the fingernail marks down your back. It took longer than I would have liked, and for that I commend you. You dug me deeper than your bloodied hands should have allowed, but even so, it was never more than a shallow grave. I made a promise as I dragged myself into the weak forest light, as I vomited up the quagmire that you shoveled down my throat. Wherever I was, I would find you. First lesson, my love, we do not stay dead so easily. You declared me dead in my absence. I know because the keys to our house were no longer under the rock where we'd always hidden them. A new family sat in the living room we painted. A new family screamed at me when they saw the clots of blood on my chest and clods of dirt in my hair. They shooed their children to back rooms as I choked out a plea for help, for an explanation, for even the date on the charity calendar on our wall. It read May, but all my memories were of crisp leaves and the first swirl of smoke out of chimneys. Did you bury me that long? Where were you for the first fall of snow? The family did not let me use the shower, but I doubt I could have stood for as long as it would take to scrub the filth off my skin regardless. They called an ambulance for me, even watered down the story in a way I couldn't have done for them, not with dust having stolen the saliva from my throat. They declare me a missing person, found, a body, resurrected, the coming forth of Lazarus in grave clothes of rot. It was not a doctor, but the police who escorted me to a concrete room where I cried your name. Perhaps I should be glad, as I do not know what a doctor would find under drying mud and cracking bones. The police's dissection proved no more fruitful, however. There was no crime they could pin to me, nor was their name. The police do not keep records of my kind, my love. They hemmed and hawed and asked where I had been. But how could I tell them you had left me in the maw of the hungry earth? Only you know the answers, and you were not there to tell. I told them what they needed to hear, that I didn't know, they told me what they thought I needed to hear, which is that they don't run a charity, and I would have to go elsewhere. So they left me here, in this place so distant from the house we once shared, or the grave that I once filled as it filled me. I drift among those with form, but not substance. My room is not my own, but shared with another who I see only burrowed among stained sheets. I lie awake now, for I have slept enough, and I watch a ceiling that is too far above and too close all at once. My heart aches to pump in time with yours. Somewhere beyond these walls, perhaps you lie awake as well, 
or perhaps you sleep, seeking solace in the notion that you have consigned me to dust. Second lesson, my love. The size of the world is not what matters. It is what is in it. They did not want me there, as I spent the night coughing mud-thick saliva down the metal posters of the bed. They encouraged me to wash away the dirt that encrusted my eyes, but the only place to do so was among the others who had been deposited there, and I do not want them to see the wound that still weeps under borrowed clothing. Already blooms of red play among the swirling dyed flowers. They did not want me there, so I did not stay. I left the one who has not moved from beneath their sheets and walked the endless city. I inhaled the burn of gasoline and stolen air. There's rain on the horizon, but you are not there. I looked for you in every beautiful place, but the people there do not share your features. They do not know what I am, and they do not know what we have done. I wanted to ask if they had seen you with bandages up your arms or with that knowing smile on your face, but the words felt like gravel in my mouth. Instead, I drift through the world on legs that feel too light without the crush of earth above. I do not see you, my love, but there are places still. There will always be places still. I'm here now on the hill where we last met. Do you see me? We fell upon each other here, our bodies pressed and our blood mingling on this vast expanse. The sky rumbles and tears like the release of the bullet you drove through my skin. I see the people I once thought were like you shred themselves in buildings to hide from the deluge. They are no more than the worms that once made a home among my body. You are the lightning flashing overhead. You are the hiss and burn of ozone. You are the roll of thunder. You once believed me other for not being of their crawling kind, the kind you thought yourself a part of. You believed you were doing the world a service by washing the likes of me off this earth. How could you not see that we have always been one and the same? The clouds open to let the sky anoint me alone. Cold droplets kiss salt tears in the remaining earth from my face. When they are gone, there will be no evidence of you but the wound in my chest. I will not let it close. Third lesson, my love. I will never leave you. Me. Apologies, the number you are trying to reach has been disconnected. Please check your connection and try again. Apologies, the number you are trying to reach has been disconnected. Please check your connection and try again. Apologies, the number you are trying to reach has been disconnected. Please check your connection and try again. Me. Yes. Wow, thank you. That was uh, that was a surprise ending. <laughs> oh boy, someone pouring your heart out only discovered the message was not delivered. But yeah. <laughs> it's not going through. Yeah, you know, some things happen in life. You know? Oops. But oops. Now, where can we find you before that you go? You have a website and you're on Twitter, I guess. Uh yeah, I'm inordinately bad at social media <laughs> so i'm technically on twitter i'm there you can follow me and every so often uh, you will get a random update from me um basically the best way if you're not sure where to find me is to just search cormac baldwin <laughs> in quotation marks and that's usually where it's easiest to find things i'm connected to um yeah basically it's it's, it's a guessing game. I don't have a real central location. I have a website that's essentially just a link tree of like, hey, do you want to see what I'm up to? It might not necessarily be anything like anything else that I've written. So here, try <laughs> try over here, see what happens. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Have Bye. For more upcoming episodes of the Artsy Raven about writing and publishing, visit us at jfgarrard.com slash podcast. A reminder to Patreon subscribers that there is bonus content available for every episode on the Patreon website. If you enjoyed the show, you can show your appreciation by buying us some digital coffee. The Artsy Raven is produced by J.F. Garrard. The voice in the show's introduction is Chris Gorman, and music is by Tim Moore. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, stay safe. Mm-hmm.